Hello and welcome to Cicerone Live. I'm Hannah and welcome and um, thank you for joining me for this event this evening. Um, tonight we're discussing the wild country backpacking in Scotland and the highlands and islands of Scotland are home to the most ruggedly beautiful, expansive and challenging back backpacking country. I just kept put my teeth in. Um, We've got David and Stefan, who are two of the authors of the book, and they're going to be doing a little presentation for us um, and really getting into why you should go to Scotland backpacking, um, what the concept of wild country means to them, um, and of course, answering as many of your questions as we can possibly fit in. So if you do have any questions at all about backpacking, um, please email them to live at cicerone.co.uk or comment on Facebook and YouTube and we'll pick those up. Um, so just a little bit about um, the book, first of all, it's available soon from Cicerone Press. If you go to cicerone.co.uk, you can pre-order that now. And it's a, it's a sort of coffee table style um, inspirational book and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, we'll talk a little bit about whether it's a guidebook or not, um, as well in this session, um, but it, it really is absolutely beautiful. So yeah, I'd get your hands on a copy of that if, you, if you're if you at all interested in backpacking um, or if you've got aspirations to, to get into backpacking. Um, so as I said, we've got David and Stefan here with us tonight. Um, David is from South London originally, um, but got introduced to the Outdoors as Scout. Um, He's also very keen on photography and they are lucky enough now to live in the Cairngorms, um, which is, yeah, fab, well escaped uh, from the down south, I say. Uh, Stefan spent a, a long time um, backpacking at a young age in the Cairngorms as well. Um, he's explored the Scottish hills pretty thoroughly um, and he's, he's quite into history and geology and that sort of stuff. So if you've got questions for that, um, we might be able to challenge him with those. Um, Peter Edwards is the other author of the book and sadly he can't join us. Um, he's our Hebrides expert and he's got a guide, a, a book specifically to the Hebrides um, as well as being part of this project as well. So yeah, sadly he can't join us, um, but just to acknowledge that it, this book wouldn't be this book without him uh, being involved as well. So um, I will introduce, I will bring in David and Stefan and they're going to do a little presentation for you. Um, and then, yeah, whilst they're talking, have a think about what questions you've got to ask um, and get those into us as well. So hi, David, and hi, Stefan. Evening. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so should we go straight into the uh, presentation? Yeah, sure. Shall I start off? Um, cool. I will yeah. put this on screen for you now. One second. Great. Well, yeah, well, first, just to say it's been a real pleasure to work on this book, and it's even more exciting to know that there's actually people who are interested in it as well. So I hope we can kind of pique your interest further um, this evening. Um, I was going to say a bit about the authors. I think Hannah's kind of introduced us all. Um, it's actually the first guidebook that I've worked on, um, and uh, David has done one other guidebook for Cicerone, The Big Rounds, which is on uh, the kind of big fell running rounds um, uh, the, uh, in Wales, Scotland and England, um, which you may be aware of. Um, so it's been really good having three authors involved, actually, because I think just the scale of this project and the fact that we've covered islands and, uh, you know, coastal areas, um, you, you know, quite far and wide across uh, the north and west of Scotland. Um, so it, cumulatively, it's been an enormous amount of time um, to pull all, to explore and research and um, walk all these routes um and pull it all together so it has been uh, an interesting experience a good experience and and, and kind of really uh, you know I, I don't it'd be quite a lot for one person to take on i think so it's been good it has been a good experience working together on this um the the sort of the, orig the original idea i think was pete's initial thought um to uh uh, you, you kind of work on a, a backpacking book uh, or a book specifically about backpacking um, in the highlands and specifically looking at the kind of the wilder areas um, uh, mainly in kind of the north and the west and the islands and uh, and also some of the areas around the Cairngorms as well 
Um, and uh, David and I came on board really quickly when this, you know, as I say, due to the, the kind of the scale of it became apparent and we kind of um, worked up the idea uh, b between us um, uh, and started kind of, um, you, you know, kind of uh, pulling together the idea for kind of different, you know, what routes we could, uh, we, we could include in this. Um, so we've each kind of brought our own things to it, I guess. I mean, Pete, uh, you know, Pete's based out in Hebrides and he's very much a kind of expert on uh, the, the islands. He's, he's um, authored a, a guidebook uh, on the Hebrides to, uh, for Cicerone, um, which uh, I think is, is one of Cicerone's kind of favourite titles. Um, you know, he's, he's very kind of well versed in the kind of coasts uh, and the islands. And, uh, you know, David, David and I are perhaps um you, you know more of a focus on the mainland and and uh, uh summits and ridges and things like that and uh so it's been good to kind of get that mix across the different landscapes um david's also pretty well known for his photography and there's loads of his photography in in the book which is just absolutely stunning when you, when you see it um just fantastic um photography in the book uh and he's david's also Quite knowledgeable and has written quite a lot about some of the cultural aspects of the highlands as as well and and that that kind of really comes through in in, in the book as well um uh, as for myself i've uh, you know i've got quite a keen interest on on the historical aspects some of the old um routes and paths crisscrossing the highlands um and uh, the kind of the, the geology the kind of deep time aspects as well um so we've each got our own kind of special areas but but we we've overlap we overlap quite a lot as well so I guess the concept, you know, what, what kind of makes this book different and, and special, um, you, you know, why, why, why should you kind of um, take an interest in this book? Well, I think, you, you know, the, the, we've, um, one thing about Scotland, and if you've, if, if you've been in the Highlands, I'm sure you know it, is it's, you know, Scotland's obviously a small country, but the Highlands um, is kind of, uh, it's kind of like the TARDIS in a way, you know, there is, there's, um, there is so much hill country and open space and and i think the nature of the west coast as well that kind of really heavily indented coastline all the way up the west and the islands means that um you can really lose yourself up there there's there's a lifetime's worth of exploring up in the highlands i mean i've, I've been going up for going for years and you know still have a list as long as both arms of places to kind of visit and explore so uh, you, you know I, I, and, and i think um it's quite a unique place in the UK, and and I think um, you, you know it's you, you can see when you go up into the Highlands the kind of draw it has for um, people from abroad from across Europe as well. Um, so it's a very special place, really. Um, I, I think you, you know Munro's the, the kind of hill bagging aspects of Scotland. You know Mun Munro's and Corbett's that's pretty well established and well known. And there's a lot of um, you know the guidebooks that are there's a lot of guidebooks. Um, around hill bagging, Munro bagging and so forth. So that's very, very well covered. And these guidebooks are kind of focused largely on, on day trips. Um, and a lot of these routes are kind of, you know, you've got your kind of honeypot routes that are very popular and very well covered. Um, but I think what we were kind of seeing was, you know, from our experiences that this kind of, uh, there's so much more kind of off the beaten track as, as well. I mean, there is such a huge amount of ground uh, in the highlands, um, so many glens, old tracks, mountain passes, there's the islands, there's coastlines, there's vast amounts of incredible country. Um, and there's a lot more, you, you know, if you're, you, you can kind of explore that, you know, we wanted to show how you could explore that. And also if bagging summits is your thing, we've got a lot of kind of summits and hills in, 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 in it as well. And um, looking at ways that you can combine them in different ways um, and uh, find new ways up hills and linking different mountains together. Um, uh, and I think we just wanted to kind of really bring that out. That there is a place where you can kind of let your imagination um, really take over in, in, in planning your routes. Um, and it's a perfect place for backpacking as well. Um, I think the other thing to mention as well uh, that, that really makes Scotland quite unique is, is uh, the, the access and camping, you know, legislation around access and camping that we have, that we've got, you know, we had the Land Reform Act in uh, Scotland in 2003, and that's really established like, effectively a kind of a right to roam um, in, in Scotland. So there is that freedom to, you know, obviously within 
within sensible limits. I mean, there's a Scottish Outdoors Access Code, which I'd advise anyone who's uh, new to Scotland to kind of take a look at that, um, about how, how it kind of works in practice. But really, you know, we have that freedom to explore, um, to camp, um, you, you know, you, you're not kind of restricted in the way that you are in, in, in some of the other um, hilly areas uh, of, of the UK. Um, so it really is, you know, the, 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 it's your oyster, really. You, you can you can explore far and wide. Um, and uh, the, as I say, there's, there's so much kind of open ground as well. Um, the, other, the other thing that um, I think really struck a chord is, the, uh, I don't know, people may be aware of the Cape Wrath Trail, which has seemed to grow in popularity in recent years. And that's kind of unway marked kind of um, route between Fort William and Cape Wrath up the West Coast. And um, it's, it's unway marked, it's a notional route. There's lots of variations. You can find your way along there. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that kind of uh, has really sort of begun to kind of just open up some of the possibilities. But obviously that's a big commitment doing the Cape Wrath Trail, but uh, you know, what we have in this book are, almost like ways that you can have that experience within, um, you know, sort of shorter, uh, long, you know, periods, long weekends um, and overnight trips and things like that. Um, so we really hope that you'll kind of enjoy the routes in this book and, and you'll be inspired to sort of um, push the boundaries and in, in planning your own routes and, and it'll really kind of fire your imagination as well. Um, just to also, uh, you, you know, there's, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't really see myself as a gear expert. Maybe I don't, maybe David had have more to say or be able to answer questions in this, but, you know, lightweight backpacking has come on a long way in recent years and multi-day trips are a lot less daunting now because there is such a good um, uh, selection of, of uh, lightweight gear. Um, but both David and I are tarp aficionados. So we enjoy, you, you know, um, we enjoy sleeping under tarps and using bivy bags and that kind of thing as well. So all that has kind of made it just you know, much easier to kind of get around and you're not carrying huge weight in your back as well. That's made a big difference. That's really kind of drawn me into backpacking more and more, I think, too. Um, what else to say about the routes? Uh, I think David will probably say a bit more about uh, some of the examples of the routes we've got. But I think generally to say that um, all of the routes that this each of the routes that we've selected, um, they've got kind of a twist to them. We're visiting kind of either less well visited places or we're going to maybe including better known summits or kind of classic uh, um, kind of destinations, but kind of linking them up or approaching them in unusual ways. So we might have a kind of a, a, a twist, you know, some something of special geological interest. For example, one of our routes involves taking in the Alnac Gorge in the Cairngorms, which is Britain's uh, biggest and longest uh, glacial meltwater channel. It's a really fascinating place. Um, we've got old uh, paths, little used stalkers paths. Um, uh, we've got um, ridges which see very little footfall as well, um, linking up um, uh, summits um, from kind of unfamiliar or lesser known ridges. Um, all, all kinds of twists on, on our routes. Um, and also, again, something maybe uh, we could touch on further later on, I think, but um, just in the title of the book, we talk about wild country rather than wilderness. Um, and that's a kind of really important point for us. Um, uh, just, you know, kind of to summarise really what we're getting at here is that um, we were really keen to acknowledge in the book that Scotland's got, you know, the Highlands have got a long turbulent history. There's, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, there've been we may think of it as an empty place, but there's been people living there um, and, uh, you know, for a very long time. And we really wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so, we, you know, we talk about wild country rather than wilderness as, 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 as such, you know. Um, uh, and I think maybe uh, that's perhaps David might want to say a bit more about that later on. But, but uh, you know, we really wanted to kind of get that um, point across as well um, in, in, in the book. Um, but I think that's kind of covered what I want to say. So I don't know if you wanted to um, take over, David, and say say a bit more about some of the roots in the book. Yeah, thank, thanks, Steph. That was great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I guess probably the first thing to do um, now is to perhaps show you that, just to kind of zoom out, if you like. Um, and that's uh, th this is a just a screenshot from, from uh, one of the pages in the book. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's just the shows the breadth of the routes, really. So we're looking, this is 30 routes in the book. 
um, if you like, the guide part part of the book. Um, there's 30 routes um, from Jura in the south to Cape Wrath in the north, and right out there on the in the Hebs, out where out where Pete lives. Um, so um, yeah, and and, and hopefully um, yeah, that kind of just gives you a snapshot really of of, of the ground that's some of the ground that's being covered. Um, uh, yeah, as Steph says, there's yeah a world, uh, several worlds more to, to to go at, but that you know there's only so much you can do in in a in a, in a single volume. So um, but hopefully uh, as well that kind of gives there's a certain amount of play um, in the book in the sense that you can kind of go where the weather's good um, here. Um, and, and I think as well, the, the breadth um, of, uh, I mean, I, 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 like Steph, really feel strongly that it's, it's such a, it became such a better project because there were three people on it. Um, it's certainly, yeah, some of the routes, you know, I'm, I'm really excited by the routes that I'm reading that from the other guys that, that, that you know, it's, oh, wow, that, that, look at that. That's a, that's a great, uh, a great option or that's, a, that's an exciting way to do that, that, uh, you know, that area or whatever. So, um, and I think as well the diversity really um it's it may have impacted on on ultimately on on the design of the of the project but i I might come back to that later on um i think but um but anyway just just for the next wee while um i might just um we, we, we thought it'd be fun to um to show some of the photos that are obviously in the book but also to show if you like some of the ones that didn't make it didn't make the final cut they can't all go in um much to my uh, chagrin, um, uh, but but yeah, uh, here, here's a bit of a making of really, um, and maybe just covering some of the um, ground that, that Steph has, uh, has, has already outlined. Um, and I guess the first question for me is, you know, why bother? Why bother carting all your gear all the way up these hills and all the way around them? Um, and and I guess the answer quite quickly for me is, um, you just find yourself, you can get yourself into some amazing places, and you're quite often in these places that very special times of the day and night um and uh I'll, I'll, this is these these two or three shots are from i think it was the last effectively the last route that went in the book and it was a trip that i did with steph and i did with a friend nick is in quite a few of the photos the company that's on quite a few of these trips um uh and it's yeah pretty much as far north on, on the mainland as you can get um it's foynard and, and a couple of corvettes alongside foynard um and and it's just um if you like the, the campsite shown in these photos is it's sort of almost like a sort of a pause between the two massifs um that we visited and you don't really you wouldn't really be here unless you were backpacking um and yet being there was really fantastic it's a really special place to go to bed and wake up um and and i think as well the other part of it that's really important is um the a backpack is a continuous journey and and that's really that's certainly really important for me. And I think I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I think it's important for the for, for everyone who works on the project. Um, and 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 you understand you immer you know it's an immersive journey, and you understand we hope to understand the place that we visit, places that we visit, and better as a result of that continuous immersive journey. So that's um yeah it, it, you don't you don't get the same experience just by visiting top. Um, it's not to devalue that experience. That's that's a valuable experience too, and I certainly have done a, a, a great amount of that. But it's a different, it's qualitatively different, um, and uh, you know that's obviously the hope is that that comes across in 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 the project in the book. Um, so just sort of whistle through a few more examples, really. Um, Stefan mentioned twists and turns, and and you know how we might be trying to sort of shake up uh, traditional backpacking routes. Um, it's hard to reinvent the wheel, but we've tried. Um, so this is a, a, a trip on the Moine Mall, um, the Western Cairngorms. Um, uh, it's great to, I, you know, I love summit walking and ridge walking, but it's great to just try and add in. I was really keen to explore this little area. So this is a, it's an old stalkers track, and and it's barely used this track um, anymore. And I think you know it's kind of important to me to keep these routes open. I think uh, as well, and not many people are coming down this way, and you end up coming down into into the juniper forest, effectively, that, that gives the Bothy in Glenfeshie its name. And uh, the Bothy is called Ruechkin. Um, and that means the slope of the juniper wood. And you come down via a pretty rough path now into a juniper woodland. And it's, it's just spectacular. And yeah, that's that's quite a special, um, I guess, a, a, maybe a, a, hopefully a good example of what, of what we're 
sort of just trying to do here. Um, this is another route um, above Glen Affric. Um, again, designed definitely with the topography in mind first. So I, you know, I'm, I, look, I looked at the line really before I looked at the summits. It's not to say that the, the summits are incidental, but it's, it was about that ridge and about, and actually the ridge is really sinuous and where it winds backwards and forward. It is very snake-like and, you know, doubles back on itself and you can even do a figure eight on it if you want. Um, and it's about that journey really between the summits rather than just to the summits that, that, that you know i think that's when we are ticking there's definitely some ticks in the book there's lots of monroes and lots of corbett's but when we're doing that then then we're trying to kind of you know do it in a in a uh, you know in, in a way that includes the journey and that values that journey and also just um you know uh, it was important to i think all of us um to have some uh to, to visit some to include some natural history um and there you know the that you know, I'm sure many of the uh, listeners, viewers will will know that um, the the forests and the woods in Glenafric itself are, are well worth showcasing. You know, this is a spectacular place, and and you know, um, it's it's worth kind of including as much of that as possible where, where it's where it's sort of um, appropriate to do so. And then there's even some land art on the way, actually, and some of Pete's Pete's roots uh, kind of reference. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the kind of more cultural side of things. Um, whilst we're on the subject of forests and uh, avoiding honeypots, um, this was a route um, to the north of Torridon. So rather than go into Torridon by the usual routes and tick the big ticks, um, this is a route um, that takes in some really pretty tough hills. Um, again, three core bits here, um, but it goes by way of some community regeneration, some, some, I guess we would call it rewilding now, but actually this rewilding project started 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and um, and again, this the exit here is really tough. Um, this is uh, one of the routes I enjoyed the most, but it was a, a really, I think I lost the toenail on this one. It was pretty, pretty burly going. Um, and, and again, this particular view, not many people are seeing this. If you can get here, um, Fair play, you've done really well. Um, but uh, you know the, the book, the book, the book will get you here, and um, uh, and and it's just a spectacular place, and it's also a landscape that's been, you know, has changed and has been changed by by human beings um, over thousands of years, and certainly you know over the last few hundred, um, quite dramatically. It's you know it's lost a lot of its tree cover, and now the tree cover is coming back in. Um, and that cultural aspect, as, as Stefan mentioned, is really, you know, it's really important um, to to make mention of. I think, you know, there is there is a sort of a wilderness myth about the Highlands, um, and uh, you know, if it's a wilderness without people, I think we have to sort of, you know, that's perhaps a slightly old-fashioned view now. And I think, um, you know, anthropology and history and, and geography and sociology are all sort of coming together and maybe acknowledging that that, you know. That wilderness myth is it wasn't accurate um this route well this is a this shows a effectively a, a, an old postal path um that it uh, we used to on a route to effectively access some really quiet hills um but really spectacular places so again it's just a way of you know you can access these spectacular heights these this of the summits the traditional kind of hill baggers terrain um but you do it in a in a way that perhaps introduces some kind of cultural, some historical um, context. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, just you know, world class landscapes. You know, that's that's the thing. You know, it's it's perhaps you know easy to get inured to them by seeing so many pictures, but um, uh, you know, we do have spectacular places. We're lucky to have these places here. So. Um, and, then, and then this is another, I think, uh, an older historic route. And perhaps um, you know, bring Steph back in quickly on this one. This is one of Stefan's uh, projects. And um, did you did you want to say anything on this one, Steph? Yeah. Um, so this was. Uh, so I've got a dog barking in the background. I hope you can still hear me. But this this route was. Um, this is over in uh, kind of that hinterland between Af Africa towards the east and Kintail in the west and. Basically, I was because I'm I'm a bit of a hill bagger as well, so I was thinking that you know there's a uh, there's a very disparate clutch of there's like two Corbett's and two Monroe's really awkwardly placed around there, 
and it was, and I was thinking like, mm, how do I, you know how do I link those together? So then we came up with a very kind of winding route uh, that took in the uh, the Falls of Glomach, which I think is probably the tallest waterfall in the UK. It's overlooking Glen Elkig, so it kind of took in some of that and some of the kind of moorland uh, approaching that from kind of moorland to the uh, to the west, which is basically nobody ever. There's no kind of ticks on the list in terms of hills there, so nobody ever goes over that way. So a very winding walk over this kind of uh, this this moorland with fantastic views over this kind of lock and studded kind of area looking out and then out to the sea beyond and then uh, down to the waterfall and then from there uh, taking in um, uh, a, a very remote uh, Corbett at the back of Glen Affric and then on to Ben Atoll which is a, a big sprawling kind of Munro um, and then there's Glassfen which is another Munro just just beyond that but between those two that first picture that, that you saw there um, so I, I think we titled, I titled this route the Gates of Africa because that pass and that original, uh, that, yeah, that one, that's the, yeah. So that pass is uh, when you, you linking up Ben Atto and then Ben Fada, you have, uh, and then Glassfen, you come along uh, this, through this uh, winding, you know, quite kind of spooky, almost uh, enclosed in um, kind of pass. And you, then you suddenly come up to the summit and then you see, the beginnings of Africa and down, down towards Africa beyond, uh, uh, and that, that's looking back the way um, to the west, um, back, uh, but sort of behind from where the picture was taken. Then you're kind of looking out onto Africa, um, and that's kind of colloquially known as the, the Gates of Africa or Bilach and Schern, uh, I think it's the, the Gallic name, um, Pass of the Murmuring Stones. Um, and uh, this is, a, I mean, it's another, it's another ancient route. Um, it was uh, part of Saint Duch's way. Um, Saint Duch was a, a, a a bishop from about a thousand years ago, the Bishop of Ross, and he would walk on foot between the East uh, uh, Tain and Canach uh, over in uh, in the east, and then over this pass through the mountains, and then down to Morvik um, uh, on the west coast. So, um, uh, and it, it really is a uh, you, you know, it's I think the, the kind of the main route now between east and west is by the African Tail Way, which is kind of is a way marked route to the south of this. But this was kind of the original. Kind of through route that's that's been used for centuries, um, well over a thousand years, um, so, uh, and and then again talking about less well trodden ridges, um, we, we, you know we had uh, kind of uh, the route up to Ben Atto was a, um, a a ridge that's not normally approached from there, very long ridge, and then we have this this one here, um, just a. a um, you know, if you notice in this picture, uh, you've got a little island. Uh, this is looking down from Glassfen um, towards uh, Alochen, just at the back of Afric. Um, and you see the the island has actually got a lot of tree cover on it, a lot of shrubs, um, bushes, and tree cover. Um, whereas all around, it's kind of very, you know, very bare. Um, and you know, I think this is one of the other, I guess that kind of wild country versus wilderness thing you know um you know scotland's got you know there's parts of the the, the you know the ecosystem um missing in terms of predators and things like that so we've got a lot of um red deer and overgrazing and managing for deer stocking um so we do have this kind of landscape where uh it's very kind of overgrazed and just that little island there gives you an idea of what it would look like if um the if uh, there weren't so many deer or if there were predators moving the deer around um so uh you know you know that just kind of shows you what you know just just kind of that that kind of point about how it is it's a beautiful landscape it's a wild landscape but it's not a kind of a, a wilderness landscape as such you know um mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's another another shot that sort of relates to that this, this is a photo from a place called the, the nest of fanny um, which is at the, as as you might gather, it's um, in in the Fanix, um, and yeah, appropriately named. So there's a lot of, lot of headed deer there, um, and um, yeah, as, as as Steph said, it, these are kind of things that you kind of discover or learn more about as the more you travel through and as a backpacker. And I think that's one of the things that you know I've I've really had learned and and appreciated as as you know on the project, but also as as a as a, somebody who likes to put my kit in a bag and, and and walk walk around um a lot is that um yeah you it's, it's a very organic way to sort of learn more about your surroundings really and and you know there's 
you know, for good and ill, you know, there's, there's, you know, it's a, it's a complicated place, Scotland, like, like a lot of places. So, um, and, and, you know, and these are amazing wildlife encounters as well, albeit kind of, you know, perhaps there's a, perhaps there's a sort of a slightly unsustainable amount of, of a head of deer there, but, you know, that's, um, it's a complicated issue and, and, and political as well. So, um, but it's worth saying, um, as well that, yeah, it's not all, uh, dry, um, uh, history and ecology stuff. Obviously, there's um, this is from the, the same walk, um, which is a to coin a phrase that I think Steph used the first uh, time many years ago. It's a bit of a mon roller coaster. This one um, it is the Fanex, um, and I guess back to that idea of putting these things in the classic, some of the classics in, but with a bit of a twist. Um, the idea here really was one to do it in winter, um, and two to not just go. To the first top and then walk west, um, but to do it from the you know to do the entire ridge and 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 that meant that you know that meant that you there's a there's a quarry that you effectively you kind of walk up to the edge of right at the beginning of the route that's absolutely breathtaking and and that if you go by the standard Monroe bagging route you just miss entirely you don't see it um, so um, and and doing it in winter of course just makes it you know this was this was a pretty Pretty burly expedition, actually, um, for both Mick and I, and and yes, of course. So yeah, you're ending up in some some amazing places uh, with with uh, with no no filter. Um, so just I think perhaps just one more route, Steph. I think this was one of yours, and I was along taking pictures. And um, did you want to add anything uh, on these lines? Yeah, so this was um, uh, again. It was one of those uh, ones linking up a, a you know a nice kind of elegant way of linking up a kind of um, disparate sort of clutch of Munros and Corbetts. And this this was in the country sort of south of um, Achnesheen, uh or south south of Achnesheleth rather. Um, uh, and yeah, beautiful, uh, stunning winter weather. This was in February, I think we did this one, wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, we we stayed in a very nice remote bothy there as well, um, and uh, yeah, I think I think for for me this one just uh, you know just kind of exemplified what it was all about. You know, we had we we ticked a lot of summits, um, some quite awkward and remote ones. Um, we linked them up in a really satisfying way. Um, we got in some really wild and remote spots, and uh, that's the uh, Bernays bothy there. Um, which uh, you, you you know there's no way to get to that other than going up some very steep hills, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and that must have been the second night, wasn't it? Camping on the on mm -hmm. the big lift between the two Munros, Biddy and Akori Shizgik and Lord Moore. Um, uh, so th so these are the ones when you look at the, I guess this one if you look at this in a kind of in in a kind of Munros guidebook, they're giving you a very kind of awkward and taxing there and back again journey in a day sort of thing, but um, to do this and gets and bags some corbets into the bargain in a lovely kind of round trip um really kind of you, you know kind of immersing ourselves in this area it was just such a satisfying way to uh, to do it, was, it. yeah so, it was a, yeah. it was a really fantastic enjoyable um, yeah. journey this one um so yeah just to, to round up because we've, we've probably kind of chatted for too too long um but um yeah just just to mention as well that of course apart from all our kind of um uh, ridiculous fantasy, sort of like fantasy island route, uh, routes or hill bagging, really, uh, an excuse to do some of that. There, there is, of course, some practical information in the book, um, in the introduction. There's quite a lengthy cha introductory chapter or chapters um, that, of course, kind of, you know, contain hopefully some useful uh, pointers to, you know, wild camping and, and a subject dear to our hearts when we're away, uh, which is food. Um, whatever we eat, whatever we do, um, it always, you know, um, an army marches on its stomach, um, and um, and things like you know river crossings and and uh, and bugs, particularly sort of yeah, particularly uh, buggy afternoon evening there uh, to show. Um, and then I'll just round up very quickly, um, just by coming back to that point about um, the format of the book. So as Hannah mentioned in the very beginning of the um, talk, um, we've ended up with something that's slightly larger than than. Um, than a, if you like a traditional kind of what I kind of think of as like sort of a wee brick, um, the kind of the, the small guidebooks that um, Cicerone is so well known for. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it wasn't always the case that we were going to end up with this. That was sort of, a, you know, the process involved. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're one, of the, one of the things obviously from 
you know, it's nice to showcase the, the photos just a little bit bigger, and, and hopefully that will um, inspire um, and, and, and be, be nice to look at. Um, but also, we realised, I guess, that some of the routes, you know, some of the routes are quite off, well, some of the set parts of the route are quite off piste, and so it, it's useful to have the maps just at a bigger scale, or at least to have them, you know, easier to read. Um, and so we, you know, we, we ended up with a, a book that's slightly bigger, um, and you know, with the idea that perhaps people wouldn't necessarily always be taking the whole book on you know for every route but they they might have it on the car dashboard or they might have it in the bunkhouse or in the hotel or the b and b and it would be and it would then allow folk to either dip in and out if they live in local in scotland and and they can you know they're trying to fit these trips in between you know life commitments or if they you know if people are coming up for a, a trip for one or two weeks or maybe even more um, from further afield then they can bring the book with them Excuse me, and then effectively go where the go where the weather is, and 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 then effectively you, you can always do your planning on the hoof then, um, and and so hopefully we've ended up with something that's that's um, you know nice to look at and is inspiring, but then you know it is a good toolkit. That's you know that's the that's really the the holy grail. You know you've got something you know, that that ticks all all of those boxes um, ideally. So so um, yeah. Hopefully, we've, that's what we've ended up with. Uh, it's, like, it's up to up to you, the, the reader, to to get past final judgment. And and with that, I will uh, stop yakking. Okay. Um, thanks, both of you. That was an excellent, if a little long, um, presentation. Um, <laughs> you can tell that you, you're both so passionate about. Um, backpacking and about Scotland um, and it is often the way uh, that people do get a little bit carried away um, so we will we will go to our questions and we will have to keep the answers probably pretty uh, swift um, but I just wanted to just really really quickly can you just define what backpacking is and what skills and experience you need um, to go and do some of the routes in this book Okay, my mic's open, so I'll go. Um, backpacking, uh, it's uh, walking from uh, from after breakfast until about tea time, and sometimes <laughs> if you get timings wrong, a bit longer than that, um, and uh, taking everything that you need or most of the things that you need uh, with you um, to to keep you comfortable and keep you safe um, for a day out, a day out and a night out, um, and and then and then hopefully doing the same again the next day for as long as humanly possible yeah and we we had a question actually from Jonathan and he was asking about um public transport routes um or that he wants to kind of enjoy some of these routes without using the car and one thing that I've picked up on from the book is actually that you are accessing places that you can't get to in a car so they by their nature they are car free um, because you might be able to drive to the start, but then you've got to you've got to walk to access some of these places, and that's part of the yeah, beauty of it. That, um, that, that, yeah, that, that is true to a point. I think where I think wherever we can access by public transport, we have signposted that. Um, I can think of one or two routes in particular that, that, that you know where where that's been done. Um, so I you know where where you can take a train. There's a couple of routes actually. The the route that Steph was just talking about at the end there. You could definitely take the train to the start of that. So, um, and and what and another one of the routes that um, in the Cuban forest you could you know. That. So so it's true to a point. Um, uh, there are of course wider pressures. You know, so um, Scotland's public transport infrastructure is is suffered has suffered in the same way as the UK's transport infrastructure has suffered to a point. So yeah, it's um yeah well, it's um it's hard to square all those circles within the. Uh, I guess within the province of a, of a guidebook, but where where you can um, use public transport, uh, I'm, 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 I can say that we've we've done that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean car sharing as well. We did a lot of car sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. I mean, so so Steph's in Edinburgh. I, I'm in the Cairngorm. So so we'll we'll relay that. You know, so if we do a trip mm. together, and 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 sometimes there's a third person with us, Nick, as we mentioned. So and and you know they'll pull their car. To at Perth or somewhere, and then and then I you know I do the next uh, the next stints up north. So yeah, car sharing is a really good thing. I'm pretty sure there's I mean things like Facebook groups are really useful for that. Um, you know, social media is useful for for that, and I know that I I see that I see that happen. I see that work. So. 
Yeah, one thing one thing that is really nice about the three authors on this book is, and I think it came out beautifully actually with your presentation, is that you're not just interested in hill bagging, even though there is a little bit of that. You're not just interested in getting the miles in or, you know, just taking the pictures. You've got a real connection to the landscape and in quite a holistic way, you know, taking the photos, but also being part of the landscape and caring about your impact on the landscape. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, when you spend a long time, well, not even a long time, but if you go to some a lot of these places, you, you begin to notice, um, uh, you, you know, you begin to notice things, you notice um, the, you know, there's a lot of ruined villages and shielings um, in the glens, you know, it becomes quite obvious that there's a, there's a whole kind of uh, culture there that's not there anymore. Um, that you, you know, it's almost like how deep do you want to go into the history? I mean, there's a there's some very old kind of hill tracks um, crossing the country. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've heard it said. I don't know if this is, you know, it's one of these kind of internet cliches, but you know, it's quite often heard it said that Scotland's the most, Scotland's the most haunted country in the world. You know, um, and there's kind of a lot of um, there's a lot of history and a lot of things have happened um, in in the Highlands um, and. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, I hope it doesn't sound too kind of airy fairy, but there is a definite atmosphere about the place, and and you do notice, you, you know, as you get tuned in, and you, you you kind of spend a lot of time in the peace and quiet um, in some of these these places. They have an atmosphere, and there are uh, a lot of traces um, of uh, from the past. And I think I think um, you you know. Uh, when you slow down a bit you really kind of start to to notice these things and it kind of grows on you a bit um and i, I think i'll probably speak for david as well we've um inevitably as you know uh we've developed an, a kind of a curiosity and an interest in, in kind of the big the bigger picture if you like you know um from spending time up uh, up north in the highlands anything to add david yeah i mean it's i mean and, and i guess yeah, i mean i agree wholeheartedly with all of that um uh, I think, yeah, on a more practical, from a more practical point of view, um, uh, in terms of impact, then you know, absolutely, like you know, you you you're in a place that where, yeah, perhaps you're becoming more aware that the ecosystem isn't quite you know as it sh could be or as it should be in some cases, as Stefan pointed out with his you know his that shot of the island, um, and you you know that's like well. You, know, you come you might come away the first time thinking well why is that you know i'm I'm curious you know and then you you know do some do some reading and 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 maybe see some more places that are, look different or that have the same you know and then you end up with the same uh the same uh conclusions and 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 so yeah that 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 curiosity that's born out of walking and engaging in a sort of you know physical and mentally um then um you know it it does lead you to start to ask questions and it also means that when you are out there you know you don't want to leave a trace you know you I, I want to be invisible effectively you know I, I still like my red tent but um, <laughs> <laughs> go, that looks good in the photos but um, but, so, so vain. Um, but um, yeah you effectively you don't want there to be any traces of, of your passing you certainly don't want to be leaving any rubbish and and um, and you do, you know, you do end up thinking a lot more about, or I, I have ended up thinking a lot more about that. So, yeah. I feel like it must be even more jarring if you went somewhere like that that was so remote and there was there was some rubbish there. Um, I think that, yeah, it's obviously it's not a great thing to do, but I think sometimes you can become slightly more blinded to it. But if you, you know, if you're backpacking there and there's there's nothing, it's yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I guess it's yeah. I mean, you do, you know, the litter and rubbish. But I think I, I suppose I don't know how political you want to get, but there's also the kind of the larger scale vandalism, I suppose, of how the the you know the place is managed. Um, and then I, I think you know you get into whole questions about uh, who actually owns this and what are they doing with it and whose benefit is it for and that kind of thing. And why is the you know in some places why is the ecosystem the way it is and why is it denuded and so forth. You know, so. Um, yeah, you do start to notice these things. Yeah. 
Yeah, sadly, we don't have enough time to get into the politics of uh, land management, no, no, fine. <laughs> which is <laughs> it's probably a good a good thing for us all. Um, but you're right, it is fascinating. And I think when you do spend time out walking or cycling or whatever activity you're into, I think it's it's impossible really not to get a curiosity about what's around you and, and what's happening to the places that you love. Um, and you do explore that a little bit in the book as well, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing is that it's this is, you know, it's it's great. Uh, it's a physical uh, activity is is really yeah, it's good for good for the soul, isn't it? It's good for the body. It's good for the soul, and 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 but also it's yeah, it's it's good for the mind as well because you know inevitably you end up kind of kind of going why is that why is that that thing like that thing is you know it's and and, and that's a, that's a healthy thing it's it's healthy to ask questions and, and and then to try and figure out some of the answers even if we even if we get it wrong sometimes so yeah. Yeah. So from that slightly philosophical um, level, coming down to something, the nitty gritty, as it were, um, Jackie has asked the inevitable question about ticks. Um, how much of a problem are ticks? Um, she says she's always wanted to ba uh, backpack the Cape Wrath Trail. Um, she's really happy with the challenges of the difficult terrain and the bad weather, but she's put off by ticks. Um, yeah. How much of the the problem is these tick-borne viruses in Scotland compared to other places in Britain. What would you say, Steph? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to say you're not going to get bitten by a tick because I've had a lot of ticks, but, um, you know, it's, it's. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to kind of, I, I, you know, it's not, I, I guess the big worry is Lyme's, Lyme disease, isn't it? Um, and, and it's uh, it's only a minority of ticks actually carry that virus. I'm not going to put a figure on that, I can't remember, but you're pretty unlikely to come across a tick that has Lyme disease. Although, of course, there is a risk and you should be aware of, um, you, you know, if, if what, what kind of problematic bite kind of might look like in terms of a rash and that, that kind of thing. So, yeah, by all means, educate yourself, carry a tick twister, or one of those tick removal devices. Um, if you're not confident getting it out yourself, get someone else to do it for you, you know, um, to make sure you get the tick out cleanly. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it definitely shouldn't put you off. Absolutely not, you know. Um, okay. uh, Just, I, I, um, the other thing, sorry to interject, is the other thing to yeah. carry if you're going on your own is um, have, have a little wee mirror. Um, carry a little, <laughs> uh, like a vanity mirror or something, because there's obviously, you know, Ticks can sometimes attach themselves in places that aren't easily, uh, you can't easily see on your own or that you might be um, feeling too modest to show to somebody else. And that's totally mm. um, fine and, and understandable. And, and so, yeah, if you have a little mirror, um, sometimes they have these like little credit card ones, I think, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah. Or, a little, or kind of, you know, makeup mirror or something. And, um, and, that, and that can be a useful kind of, yeah, definitely that with a tick twister or a pair of tweezers and, and just, you know, um, and I think, yeah, the thing is, yeah, there is, um, because the deer population has increased so dramatically over the last few decades, then yes, there are probably more ticks now than, anecdotally, I'd say there are more ticks now than there were. Um, but some people as well seem more susceptible than others. So I'd seem a bit less susceptible, but I know that my, my partner, my other half is, you know, she's a tick magnet. So, um, so perhaps that's why I don't get so many when we're out together. But, um, but yeah, definitely, I I definitely go up, you know, get get educated, get the two tools, get the mirror, and get the tick twister or pair of tweezers or whatever, however you want to deal with them, and then just go anyway, you know, just do it, and 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 and, and then just check yourself, you know, every night, you know, if you're out. You know, yeah, I think I think um, uh, to be honest, uh, midges, although they're not kind of harmful, are probably more of a worry and, and you do actually have you know we joke about midges but we really do have to take them seriously uh, it can absolutely ruin a trip so um uh, particularly you know getting in uh, beyond may i would say to be on the safe side always carry a head net with you um if you're camping ditch the bivy bag and get one of those if you're using a tarp you'll get one of those mesh inners for your tarp um if you're using a tarp um, and have all the kind of the mid repellents and you can get mosquito coils and things like that because um, it's it, it really is no joke and I, I've actually literally been reduced to tears um, by, by them before um, so uh, yeah I, I would be more worried about those than ticks personally. But. Yeah I've had that experience where I've just yeah. I've been driven pretty insane and and stopped stopped finding it funny after a point that they were just biting everywhere and so yeah. I remember one time just like 
tearing my hat off and throwing it on the ground and getting in the right strop. So, yeah. And one comment actually I had about, about the ticks was if it's if it's decent weather, actually wearing shorts is quite good because you can see the ticks on your leg before they bite. Um, so if it's if it's OK weather, you can sort of glance down and then if there are any, just brush them off. Um, yeah. I guess it's one of these things that it's there's a there's a risk of these things and all you can do is is minimize manage the risk, it. But... Yeah, manage the risk. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, yeah, it's it's in a way, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it sounds flippant to say, but you know, crossing the road is is probably um, technically far more statistic you're far more statistically likely to get uh, injured crossing the road than you are to get. Lyme's disease and um, or get hurt whilst um, backpacking, providing you're kind of sensible and and you kind of manage your um, expectations and manage your ambitions and, and you know just add on a little bit more uh, excitement each trip you as you go and, and, and so on. So. Is there is there anything that um, that puts off ticks? Any of these creams or anything that acts as a repellent? I'm not sure that whether smidge does any anything. I think if I think if they're gonna, I think they. It, I mean, I might be wrong. Um, so I, I heard that um, there's a there's a, a treatment um, that I'm not going to try and pronounce, but it begins with a P. That sometimes clothes are, um, are treated with. They're kind of in, in they're kind of. It's almost like a washing treatment. Is that permethrin? Um, permethrin. Yeah, that, that, uh, yeah. that's all those lines. So that might yeah. help deter them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can get clothes. I've seen crag hopper. I think advertising them yeah. clothes that are supposedly repel uh, biting insects and bugs. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, it would be a shame. I think. I think is the consensus. It would be a shame if that put you off, Jackie. Um, yeah. The Cape Wrath Trail is is challenging, but wow, what a reward for for those who take it on. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you do do it, and I and I hope for our sakes, as much as yours, you you do it and you don't get a tick, um, and you don't get Lyme disease because that would that would backfire somewhat on our our advice. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, other questions. So this guidebook, it's not for beginners, is it? So how experienced do you need to be for this guidebook, and can you recommend any? places that you could go if you are a beginner and you want to get into backpacking um, so how experienced you need to be i think that there are some routes in here that um uh are probably more um suitable uh, you know i guess uh, more at that introductory end so you know there are some some, some of the perhaps some of the, the three routes i'm thinking of one of, of stefan's actually that kind of a uh, it's not that it's to say that it's a simple or, or, or you know or to undersell it, but there's there's a Cairngorms route that perhaps sort of doesn't necessarily go over so many of the tops. I'm, I'm wondering whether that might be a bit more suitable. I'm also thinking of another another one of um, mine. There's a, a, a couple of Corbett's. Um, one is called Streep, and yet whilst we do it in winter, um, you know that would perhaps be a slightly easier proposition and a shorter proposition in in summer. Um, one of the things that perhaps, yeah, on, on, on you know, it, it's um, it's uh, what, what I, I, I don't think this book is necessarily for complete beginners, but I think it might give people some. I hope it gives people some something to kind of perhaps to aim for, um, and it might not be that they aim for all of the routes in one go because we did, you know, it took us, it's taken us several years to do, you know, things, but um, uh, but hopefully it gives. People, something to kind of. Um, to, I mean, I you know I, I'm aspiring to do some of the routes in the book. So, so, so some of the routes that Stefan uh, or, and what Pete did. So, um, so you know they they they, they excite me. So, so that's so that's. Um, I don't know if that answers. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to the first part of the question. The second part, um, in terms of resources, um, I would. I'm I'm a little wary of. I um, it's. I think social media for some things is fantastic. I think it can be really, it can be a good thing and when it's done supportedly, but there's an awful lot of folk, uh, an awful lot of forums, especially kind of Facebook, it seems that um, where the tendency is for it to end up in a bit of a, you're not doing it right, a bit finger waggy. Um, and there, you know, I can say hand on heart, I have made so many mistakes and, um, 
you know, luckily they've uh, I've left to tell the tale, and um, I guess perhaps I haven't made mistakes at the sort of at the risky end of my uh, learning curve. But you know, and perhaps that's the key is to start small and and work up. So be a little bit cautious about advice sought on the internet. Um, if I was getting going to get any gear advice, I'm a little bit biased because I do work and do some gear reviews for magazines. But I would say go to you know get some expert advice from people you know people who've been doing this stuff for a long time you know and, and who've got effectively have got no vested interest you know you, you know if you if you magazine review you, you there's an editorial red line around that stuff you're not allowed to to um you know to you know you, you, we're not sponsored so um so you know you take take an impartial advice and take advice from people who um who you who hopefully you can trust and and that and then the third thing is um, courses. Um, if you know, I, uh, I say this like, you know, say this again and again and again. The money I've spent on courses has been the best money I've spent in the outdoors, like hands down, like without a doubt. So um, it's kept me so safe and it's made me more confident. Whether it be like a winter skills course or a paddling course or a scrambling course or a navigation course, and I've taken all of those. Um, and they're also really great ways of meeting people, like-minded people, um, who you know uh, share your passion and your interest. And in fact, you know, it, it, you know, uh, the third, if you like, the, the third man apart from Pete, who on this project, who you know, we, I mentioned before, Mick. Quite, you know, I met Mick through a, a, a MC of S, a Mountaineer Scotland scrambling course, and then um, so. And, and, you know, now Nick and Steph and I do trips together, you know, fairly often, not as often as we'd like, but, you know, so, so a great way of meeting people and, and again, just getting that like bona fide, bona fide knowledge, you know, from people have been doing this stuff for like their whole lives, you know, and you just, you know, they just exude, exude, uh, n there's no bravado, you know, and so that, that all of that kind of, all of that sort of, um, some of the silliness that we see on social media kind of stripped away and, and people, don't have anything to prove and it's just like yeah brilliant you're here we love that you're here um let's find out how we can just you know we're gonna we're gonna have fun but we're gonna learn and that's yeah so courses 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 go on a course you know it's not money it may, it may be expensive but let's face it it's probably going to be about a third of the cost of a waterproof coat isn't it let's face it you know or a half of the cost you know so yeah 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 buy the book first obviously um <laughs> and then and then see see about a course um yeah i completely agree i think um getting some navigation skills is really critical when you're going into the the depths of scotland um navigation can be a little bit more tricky and and if you've got if you've skilled yourself then you can just enjoy it a little bit more um having that confidence so yeah i think i think getting skills is is really important but getting out there and giving it a go is also important there's just some places where you can do that um with a bit more of a, a safety backup you know if you if you're not sure where you are but you're 10 minutes away from a town it's it's a completely different picture and if you're not sure where you are and you're in the middle of the Hebrides you know mm -hmm. so I think it's it's just acknowledge what level you're at and then build something that's appropriate to your level that where you can go and try something out and, and practice um but yeah right we we are pretty much we are out of time um so hopefully uh that's inspired people um i think it was i think it was a really interesting talk um it's really nice again to see how the passion come out of you both um and i think i think you can tell as soon as you open the book it is beautiful uh, i feel like i do say that quite often because i am i am biased but you know, it is more beautiful than a standard Cicerone guidebook because the standard Cicerone guidebook is is supposed to just be practical and small and we don't have the room to put in these enormous photographs. Um, so, yeah, it feels like a really special book. Um, and it, yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's beautiful. Well, well worth the money. Um, other places you can you can go to our website, you can order the book on there. You can also sign up to our newsletter on there. Um, I will be turning this uh, this live event into a podcast. And so you can subscribe to the podcast as well and listen to that in a couple of weeks. Um, there's over a thousand articles. There's other live events um, on our website. So, 
yeah, there's there's lots and lots of information on there. There's there's probably some stuff about backpacking in Scotland written by some of our authors as well. Um, Stefan, we might have to get you to do something on the history of Scotland because we didn't have time to really let rip on that. But I feel like there's the stuff there to be uh, talked about. Um, but yeah, thank you both. And I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And I hope to see you again next month. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.